My name is Alyssa, and I am CEO of Jakuto Privacy Company and the organizer of SeekerCon. Uh, this is my first time here in Kansas, so I'd really like to thank the organizers of Midwestio for bringing me here. Uh, it's very cool for me to be here for the first time and for all of us to come together and talk tech. Uh, in terms of my credentials, uh, that's pretty much it. I've been building the security company, and I run an enterprise security event in New York City. The next one's in San Francisco. There's something I want you to keep in mind as I do this talk, and that's something called threat modeling. You know, I'm going to talk about these best practices for security, but it's really important to keep in mind your own uh, your own risk profile, right? Like what's actually a threat to you? So if you have a startup and the biggest existential threat to your startup is you're not going to be able to make payroll in six weeks, like obviously that's going to trump everything else. Um, so this talk kind of assumes that you're in a position to be thinking about the best practices for your company, uh, whether that's today or two months from now. Also, before I start, can I get a show of hands? How many people here are founders? How many people here work at tech companies? OK. Um, how many people here are software engineers at tech companies? All right, so we have a technical audience here. Cool. How many people here have a background in security? OK, cool. So I'm going to assume that you're all very technically savvy, but not necessarily like implementing encryption on a regular basis. Here are five best practices for securing the data at your company. The first is just to minimize, minimize the data collected, encrypt the data, delete the data, manage your access, and empower your CISO. The first question to ask when you're designing your infrastructure, when you're designing your product, do I need to collect this data? In other words, do I really need all this jazz? The next time that I'm uh, architecting something, I'm going to be thinking of it as jazz. Data is valuable. That's why we're collecting it. Right? Like, we can use it to customize an experience for our users. We can also sell data. We can sell our users' data. This is why we're collecting it, because it has value. But it's also a liability. The definition of liability, or one of them, is the state of being responsible for something, especially by law, but it's also an accountability and a thing that could cause embarrassment. <laughs> I think that that's a very apt description of data these days. If you lose or leak your customer data, it's extremely embarrassing. And your customers also are trusting you with their data. That's actually what got me into security, was this notion that our customers are trusting us with their data, and I want to respect that relationship with them. So I want to secure the data they're giving me because there's an implicit belief, mistaken or otherwise, from the customers that we're going to be good stewards. That trust is degrading, but I don't want to be part of that. I like this tweet from security engineer Jesse Irwin. If you like it, then you better put some crypto on it. <laughs> this was very popular, as you see, like over a thousand retweets even when I saw it uh, in the security community. So yeah. like. Your data is valuable, you like it, so you'll put some crypto on it. Using encryption for sensitive communications, this is just a list of some of the things you can do internally in your company. You can use encrypted email, you can use PGP or paid encrypted email services, you can use encrypted voice, VoIP, which is voice, and you can use encrypted chat, silent circle, Wicker and Signal are good examples. When it comes to your group collaboration tools, that gets to be a bit more tricky. Uh, Microsoft is really popular, and Microsoft actually does have a long-standing track record for security. I am 
bullish on Microsoft for security and things like Link and Active Directory. We're seeing a tremendous number of organizations using Slack right now, and I worry about that tremendously because uh, Slack had a breach fairly recently. Passwords were taken. Uh, but you would be amazed at the companies that are using Slack internally, like really big Fortune 500 companies that need to manage their security really carefully. Uh, so this is a really big risk at your organization. Um, yeah, it makes me really sad. End-to-end -end encryption is the most secure. That's actually why I like Wicker and Silent Circle and Open Whisper Systems, Open Whisper Systems so much. Uh, is because you know the endpoint for your communications. Um, a show of hands uh, of the folks here who already knows what end-to-end -end encryption means. So that's a decent number of you, but enough that I'll, I'll dig in. Uh, when you send a message from your encrypted email account and you send it to someone's Gmail account, that's not end-to-end -end encrypted and it's not secure at the other end. What's nice about systems like Wicker and Silent Circle is you know that everyone else is using the same encryption that you are. Uh, it's called end-to-end -end because it's encrypted on all the endpoints. With respect to encrypting your customer data, there are too many examples. I don't even know where to start if I wanted to talk about use cases and examples of co companies that really should have and didn't. Anthem had very sensitive customer data, but legally they weren't required to encrypt it and they didn't. And when they had a breach, it was extremely embarrassing. It would have been far less embarrassing if that data had been encrypted. Uh, so that's really the argument for encrypting customer data. If you do have a breach, then at least you are following best practice it's far less embarrassing. Talking about minimizing risk, I'm a big fan of deleting data, and that's actually a controversial opinion uh, these days, because data is valuable. Companies don't want to delete data. And when a user deletes data, as many of you probably know, it's not deleted by the company. It's a problem for a company to actually completely delete data because how do they keep a record of the fact that that data was deleted, right? Like there's always going to be that metadata. So if I ask Spotify to delete my account and they say that they did, how much did they delete? Did they delete that I ever had an account? Do they keep a record of the fact that I made that deletion? Uh, there are actually some hard questions there. Uh, even when you're committed to deleting data. But most companies are not because they believe that the data will be valuable someday and because data storage is so inexpensive. But keeping data is a tremendous risk. We're seeing um, so many companies getting hacked. Uh, so I'm really in favor of deleting customer data that you don't need, making that judgment call and saying, do we need to keep this data around? Do we need to keep these customer messages? Do we need to keep their social security numbers? Do we really need to have this information to deliver a really compelling user experience? And if you don't, is it worth the risk of holding on to it? Something to keep in mind is compliance and logging. Sometimes you actually really do have to keep data. That's where encryption comes in. This is thinking about when delete doesn't delete. If you're going to delete the data, you have to really delete it, right? You have to delete it from the servers, delete it everywhere. This is a good example of a conversation that I had with a company that doesn't do such a good job with transparency and that doesn't seem to be doing a good job with uh, actually deleting customer data. This was my conversation with Spotify what happens to my account data? I'd like for it to be deleted. Thank you. Everything is deleted. Don't worry. <laughs> and you can see that this is the customer service agent kind of saying what they want because of the typo, D-O-N apostrophe Y. That's definitely not a script. 
I found that to be not very compelling. And they couldn't tell me any information about uh, their process. Uh, this is actually the kind of thing that can get you in a lot of trouble. Um, Spotify is openly disrespecting their customers. Another company that openly disrespected its customers was Ashley Madison. Uh, everyone here, you've heard that Ashley Madison was hacked, right? Show of hands. Yeah, uh, so Ashley Madison is, was a site for people to cheat on their spouses. Uh, without making any judgments about that, uh, they were lying to their customers about deleting their accounts. And uh, a group of hackers took note of this and blackmailed them. They said, you're going to need to fix those policies or we're going to hack you and release your data, which is what they did. It's very noteworthy to me that a non-trivial number of the hacks that happen happen to companies that have made enemies. Uh, Sony is another example of a company where it's been rumored that uh, it was an inside job from disgruntled employees. I can't confirm that that's what happened, but it certainly puts you at risk. So this is a bit of a tangent from the five best practices. I'd say sixth best practice is to like be an awesome company so people don't want to attack you. It's a good thing to do anyway, right? Identity access management. So I talked to someone from Microsoft the other day, and I was like, I love Azure. And he works at Microsoft in Azure, and he's like, no one says that. <laughs> he's looking at me. He's like, you are kissing up to me right now. And I'm like, no, I, I love Azure. Uh, because that Active Directory, I'm like, that identity management, though. <laughs> and he's like, OK. <laughs> I really love identity management. I really, really do. Uh, I've had to fire an embarrassing number of uh, co-founders and employees, and I didn't know about things like Active Directory at the time. I didn't know that there were software platforms that can help you manage who has access to company data. And so people would leave my company and be like, wow, that sucks that they still have access to everything. I'll ask them really nicely. I'll like negotiate. Um, and I've kind of operated like this for the last few years. I'm a scrappy startup founder. And like startup people don't talk about security. It's kind of new that I'm digging in really deeply into enterprise security and discovering these things. So for all these years, <laughs> I had this problem. And I wondered what companies do. And a lot of CIOs have come to me wanting me to solve their problem of employees bringing like Slack and, and not approved software and devices into the office. And part of the reason why they're so upset about that is they don't have that identity management. It's not federated. Uh, the CIOs really need to manage who's on the platform. Um, and that's because contractors are a risk and employees need to be granted just the right amount of privileges. So these are just graphics. People really love LDAP, which is like Active Directory, except really hard to implement. So, but like, it's like more open source, so people love it. It's like, yeah, but you're going to do it wrong. Um, I talked to a really great security person, uh, John Callis, last night. And he seems, I think he likes LDAP. And I'm like, well, if you implement it, it's fine. But like, for the rest of us, um, there's just so much that can go wrong. On the topic of going wrong, uh, I thought that Snowden's actually a really good example of a third party contractor who had too much access. Snowden had this, it was a tremendous NSA breach, right? Like, this is a tremendous breach. Snowden was a third party contractor. He shouldn't even have had the access that he had, in my opinion. Like, he wasn't properly vetted for whatever qualities you should be vetting before someone comes into the NSA. <laughs> right? Like, you should be vetting for a certain kind of loyalty and patriotism and, like, adherence to fundamental NSA mission. You bring in random contractors, they're not going to like what they see. That was a problem. And then the OPM hack. Uh, OPM, that's the Office of Personnel Management. <laughs> yeah, uh, I made that graphic a while ago. 
Root Access China, Root Access Argentina, everybody root. <laughs> and that's their seal, the Office of Personnel Management. So we talk about OPM like it was a hack, like OPM was hacked. Like these black hat hackers like snuck in at night and they like breached the servers all like fancy like, you know, using sophisticated techniques. No. Uh, the Office of Personnel Management gave root access to foreign nationals in China. That doesn't make any sense. OPM, like, they're storing the most sensitive human resource data for cleared personnel, for our spies. So all of this private information about the people who actually are U.S. spies right now, as well as people who applied to be spies and failed, like, all of that's out there in China. We don't read about this in the news, which is interesting to me, and I suspect that's because the U.S. government is not very excited about pushing, you know, this story. Um, and if I was a journalist, I wouldn't want to be the person who embarrasses, like, the U.S. federal government. Um, and, and journalists, unless they're used to covering overseas stories, or they're used to the government spinning a narrative that's not necessarily true. Journalists don't question the press releases from the government very much, really. Uh, so this is a very big story that really hasn't had proper news coverage uh, because of the state of journalism right now. And honestly, like, I take a bit of a risk being on stage just yelling about this, but I wouldn't want to be the person who writes the article for the New York Times. Yeah, so uh, don't give your root access to your adversaries. It's like pretty straight up, but people do it. Now, hiring a CISO. So actually, I could just stand up here with this one slide and be like, hey, thanks, bye. Like, that's it. If you hire a CISO, then a CISO will handle, you know, a lot of what you need to do in your company. Um, a CISO or like a CISO. Uh, Chief Information Security Officer. So what does the CISO do? Um, does everyone here know what a CISO does? Show of hands. Show of, hands up if you know what a CISO does. Okay, cool. This is useful. Uh, you never know. So a Chief Security Officer is responsible uh, for the data security within a company, the physical security often, um, and that can be both internal, like uh, the security of the group collaboration applications that are used to build the product, the security of everything internal to the company, and then also the security of the externally facing products. Um, this can vary from company to company, but your chief security officer is basically your like security expert person who's thinking at a very high and strategic level and overseeing operations. And that's very useful. Uh, that's useful because you need someone to be overseeing things throughout the whole process. I have a friend who's at a security company, and recently uh, a very important product decision was made without his input. As a result, this security company uh, is now producing something that's highly insecure. Uh, now, that's really bad because the whole branding of the security company relies on being secure. Um, so, obviously, they need the CISO to be involved from day one, uh, but that's a good thing for most companies to do anyway, um, just because the risk... These days, you don't need to be a security company to have that same need to bake security into your product and into your organization. So not every company needs a CISO, especially small startups. Um, I tried to hire a CISO recently, and he's like, nah, you don't need me. And I'm like, but we want you. And he's like, but I don't have anything to do at your company. I'm like, you'll write technical architecture. It's like, your product isn't even live. Like, <laughs> and it's like two of you. I'm like, yeah, but we like you. Like, I know I'm a hot commodity, but like, call me in six months. Um, so not every company needs a CISO, uh, and CISOs are expensive. And what are they going to do? You know, they, they oversee very high-level things, presumably like a staff underneath them. 
So if you don't have a CISO, then you can educate yourself on the security basics or hire a security engineer. Uh, when I'm building software, I'd like to bring in engineers who understand some basic security practices, and that uh, keeps us on the right track. They don't bring in like third parties that are selling data to like weird other third parties. If you do have security engineers, they need the authority and the resources to do their job. Uh, this is really, really important. Uh, and I've been thinking about this quite a bit. There are so many great CISOs, and the companies still have terrible security. Uh, you look at Sony, Sony had a CISO. Um, and I actually met one of the CISOs from Sony, and he seemed great. It's so like, why was Sony's security so messed up? Sony gets breached so many times that when I talk to someone about a Sony hack, they're like, which one? Like the PlayStation one or like the one in December, what? Like we don't even know which one because they get breached so often. Uh, and that's because of the culture within Sony. Uh, the CISO doesn't have the authority and the power in that organization. This is hard. It's hard for anyone in any organization to give power to anyone else. Uh, and the CISO isn't necessarily a personality type to be like fighting for territory. Um, sometimes you have to be, though. That's been my big insight about the CISO job, that you need to fight to have the authority that you need. And the reason why I'm so confident in my own ability to build secure software is mostly that I'm getting out of the way. You usually have somebody blocking security in an organization, whether it's uh, the salespeople or the marketing people or the CEO. Um, so if the CISO is good and can do his or her job, then you'll probably be OK. But uh, that is extremely rare. It's extremely rare. I read this article uh, this morning and wanted to put it in. Uber just hired, I think it was in April, its first chief security officer. Now, Uber has been like made of money for years. Like Uber fundraises and it's like 10 billion, it's like billions of dollars. Uber has so much money. So it wasn't like they're too small or scrappy. They just didn't really think about it or didn't want to. Uh, from the article, when startups weigh the costs, it can make more economic sense to focus on improving functionality rather than figuring out how to do that security. Like, basically, the economics is <laughs> if you do security well, no one appreciates it. They only appreciate it when you mess up. So for a company that's really focused on high growth, it actually can be really tricky to make that decision uh, to secure your organization. Um, I really believe that the decision to secure your organization is like an ethical one as opposed to necessarily a business-driven one uh, because it's very high risk if you have poor security, but you can go a long time before that actually bites you. Um, so for me, it's about like transparency and trust with my users and making that like a reason why they'll love my company and my brand. Otherwise, like the business sense, um, sometimes companies don't want to put the resources and the time in. And, and actually, it, it kind of makes sense, but um, it's kind of awful. Uh, and Uber has suffered for that. Like Uber's made some choices that haven't been great for the brand. And this falls under that category. All right, so we're at Q&A now, which is just about uh, the right time. I wanted about 15 minutes. That's what we've got. Uh, the folks at Midwest DO have a microphone that they'll pass around. Uh, so let's do some Q&A. And I'm kind of informal. I'm just going to come on down off the stage and get a little closer to you guys. That's all right, right? Uh, so uh, we're coming over with the mic. If you'll say your name and the question real loud so they can hear you in the back. Hi, uh, Wesley Hoffman. I was kind of curious. Uh, this isn't really about user data that companies want to use, but more along the lines of the EU has um, security protocols for both servers and services that right. the United States does not have, which raises their uh, kind of 
security ability. They, they're more secure with their data over there. What is it going to take for the United States to get to the point where it's, it's now the legal thing? I guess the question is, why haven't we gotten there yet because of all these leaks? That's such an interesting question. Uh, so the EU is, a, is very different than the United States and how they operate and in what they value. What we're seeing coming from the US government right now is this tremendous emphasis on intelligence gathering for the FBI, for the CIA, and the cybersecurity legislation that's going through now is called cybersecurity legislation, uh, but it's being proposed by groups like the Senate Intelligence Committee. Uh, the CISA bill that just passed in the Senate is a fantastic example of that. Uh, it was put forward by the Senate Intelligence Committee. It is an intelligence gathering bill, and it is being promoted as a bill to secure America. Uh, so I believe that the biggest issue is that the leaders in our government are letting themselves be led by the FBI, by the NSA, by the CIA, for reasons that are entirely unclear to me. We don't know why our senators are going along with this. It doesn't make sense. Are they not reading the bills? Are they being blackmailed? Do they believe that this is in the interest of the, of the country? At any rate, like, our government leadership currently values intelligence gathering rather than strengthening security. Uh, Alec Askelson. Um, so you mentioned that uh, some small companies, when they start, don't necessarily have their minds focused on like full, rigorous security. Um, yeah, because you got to make payroll. And that's threat modeling, right? Yeah. And, and I mean, finding, certainly when you're hiring, finding engineers who like have a background in even securing web applications can be kind of hard. So if you were a small company uh, and none of your engineers necessarily had expertise, um, how would you recommend that they start? Because the security, like, uh, sort of section of just web applications, right, and, and just like securing databases is filled with loads and loads of information. Um, you can find loads of tutorials, but, but how do you really yeah, like, start? Yeah, it, it's really hard for new people to break into security. Security is an industry that has a very high barrier to entry. Uh, and some of it is that um, we don't, we, meaning security people, don't want new people coming in and like rolling bad crypto. Uh, so we actually intentionally have some of those barriers. Uh, there are two spaces that come to mind that are designed to welcome new people. One is ShmooCon coming up in January, and they welcome first time speakers, and they're just a wonderful conference out of DC. And I highly recommend going to ShmooCon as a way to meet people and get started that way. And also part of the goal of my conference, SecretCon, is to bring in new people and to answer questions and to be a friendly, nice resource. Uh, beyond that, I would look at the specific security needs of your company. Uh, and then uh, if they're great developers, they can use the Google and start from there. And yeah. Um, as a lot of vendors have moved to the cloud, how, what are some yeah. rules in, of thumb in like assessing secure services or services that you know applications can depend on? Yeah, I've been thinking about that too, uh, and that's where like I love Azure came in, <laughs> which is uh, Microsoft's cloud offering, uh, and I like Azure because uh, Microsoft has a good reputation uh, for enterprise security. Um, over a very long period of time, and that's their cloud offering. Uh, I also really like Rackspace, and Rackspace has a fantastic reputation for security, and I've almost never heard of outages. I want to say I love AWS, and I do, and I have $100,000 in credits from them. So that should buy more love, right? But AWS goes down, um, and just that sucks. Uh, I think I, like, uh so, oh, you're saying how do you assess? Well, more of like there's a bunch of uh, companies that do like air reporting and notifications and things like that, but they end up giving you client libraries that take in a, you know, a lot of your application data to do that and provide graphs and charts. And right, they're third it. parties and you yeah. need to evaluate them. Uh, and a lot of third parties aren't very good. There's a URL that you can use to evaluate uh, what kind of encryption 
and forward secrecy they're using, and I'll tweet that out later. I don't remember it offhand. Uh, and then I'd want to look at like the full stack of the company. So if a company is open source and you can actually read all of their code, that's great. Uh, if you don't have that, then I'm always looking for testimonials from trusted sources. Uh, so you need to have some trusted sources in security. If you don't have them yet, I can be your gateway to other like more credible trusted sources. Um, like I'm not the most important person in security, but a lot of the people who are in their fields will write back to me if I ask them a question. Uh, so I'm happy to be a resource there. That's what I do. If I'm not sure how I feel about a vendor, I go and ask someone who I trust as an expert. Uh, and it's actually very hard to trust software. I trust Silent Circle to the extent that I trust John Callis and Phil Zimmerman. Um, yeah. Thanks. So yesterday we heard a talk about trans translations and internationalizing your application, and it was said at the end that once you kind of start, you're never finished. And I, you know, we do security fixes at work, and I think security is a lot of the same ways. Once you start paying attention to it, yeah. it's you're never done with it. So how do you recommend, or how have other companies prioritized security work alongside delivering actual like functionality and and, and increasing business value towards the actual application? Yeah, you ultimately need to balance uh, the value of improving the application, and security goes alongside any other feature addition that way, uh, and just shipping, shipping the damn thing. Like at some point, you really do need to ship. Um, so you need to balance out how severe is a vulnerability or a lack of a feature uh, versus the necessity to ship. Uh, for example, Slack kept pushing out new features instead of rolling out two-factor authentication, and then they were hacked. Uh, two-factor authentication probably shouldn't play second fiddle to a like, moderately important feature release. Just because two-factor authentication is now like, pretty normative, people expect it, and it goes a long way towards securing things. Um, so something like 2FA, you'd want to prioritize that. Uh, but then if it's like a low-level vulnerability, something like that can probably wait unless you have reason to believe that you're under attack. Again, it's that balance between like the business value and like the necessity to lock things down and the necessity to ship something. Um, I have a question regarding cloud-hosted infrastructure. Yeah. So I think there might be um, a misperception that uh, internally hosted infrastructure might be more secure because it's under your control. Right. Do you find that to be common, and is there much data supporting either argument? I'd have to look up uh, how much data is on either side, but I've been studying this anecdotally, especially because my company aims to deliver secure data storage. And so I've been talking to CIOs and CISOs and seeing what they want. Now, a lot of them really do want data hosted on-prem, on-premise, and that's mostly because they don't trust anyone else. <laughs> and so it's less like what's more or less secure, and it's more about control. And so if they can control the data, it may not actually be more secure, but it may be more compliant with whatever their organization cares about. Uh, and I see folks nodding in the audience, right? Like, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, the rack space in Chicago, I'm told from folks who actually, like, did audits and, like, went really deep. Like, Rackspace in Chicago is one of the most secure places you can store data, uh, as opposed to the other Rackspaces and like the other providers. Um, and you can have your own cloud box. So you can have your own box without anyone else on it in the cloud. And that's actually quite secure. Like Rackspace and AWS and Microsoft, like they're really, really good at securing cloud data. Um, but if it's on-prem, it's yours. So, Hi, Scott Smirchek. Uh, my question is around uh, a lot of these companies coming out, particular Auth0, where they, where you offload identity management to them, or they'll help you connect to Office 365 or yeah. Google or whatever for identity management. What's your perspective on those services? And 
I'm seeing the same thing with companies that want you to outsource the SSL or TLS, the encryption. Uh, and, and I showed this to my developer and security friends. I'm like, I want to hear what you have to say. And they're like, they have the keys. They have your encryption keys. Why would you ever do that? Like, that's a terrible idea. Um, I think it's the same thing with the identity management. Um, there, there are some exceptions, but in general, you have Active Directory through Microsoft, and that's like really reliable and really trusted. Uh, if it's another company that doesn't have a reputation in the space, I'd really want to examine uh, either the code or who's behind the project. Um, so I'm not saying it's never OK, but uh, I want to know why should I trust you. Sure, thanks. We're out of time, right? Thank you so much. Uh, and you can find me on Twitter. Uh, let, well, it's not up there. Uh, my username's Elizabeth. I'll be tweeting under uh, the Midwest EO stuff. Um, and I'll see you all day.